Hello. <laughs> hi, hi, everybody. Thank you very much for having me. And it's uh, an absolute delight to see so many people that I've known on and off the last 20 odd years or so. Um, and also hopefully some new friends. So I'm going to follow Mark's uh, illustrious footsteps and talk to you uh, about the case study that person I've worked with uh, as a regulator. Um, I used to work for the Care Quality Commission as the Director of Quality Improvement up until about two weeks ago. Um, so I'm now able to speak as an independent voice from within and without the system and hopefully give you some interesting uh, perspectives. So just as Mark spoke about Juliet, I want to uh, use a provider, because that's what the regulators call the organisations that work with citizens and provide services. Um, and that, that provider is a lady called Helen. I'm going to bring Helen out now. So, Helen, if you'd like to come out, love. Here she is. <laughs> Helen's a provider, and she's going to talk to you about the experience of regulation from her perspective before I start talking about what regulation might look like from the regulator's point of view. Uh, thank you. Um, Mark said you need a thick skin and lots of friends. I have lots of friends. I don't have a very thick skin. Um, Wellbeing Teams is my third startup that I've bootstrapped. I speak internationally. I've done a TED talk. Last year was the scariest year of my life. I lived with um, a bit of anxiety tucked under my rib cage at all times. And um, this kind of illustrates it. So resting heart rate is generally seen as, as an example of how stressed you are. Um, can, so June was particularly difficult because I faced one of my biggest fears of the phone call at 11 o'clock saying, you're the last man standing, you're doing the morning visits. So I, I faced that, so that's why June looked like that. But um, what happened in September and October is I got the email from CQC saying, we're coming to inspect you. And you can see the impact that that had uh, on my life. They actually came in January. Um, so my experience as I am legally responsible for people's lives. I've spent 20 years as a consultant. It feels completely different being legally responsible for people's lives. And CQC terrified me. And it terrified me because I'm legally responsible, but also if I was the first self-managing team that got needs improvement, I... I change how people would think about self-management and that felt like a, a big burden um, as well. So some of the reasons why it was so scary, yes, I got the fill in this form for us, um, is that I had a very, very difficult experience of being registered as a manager and that's a conversation to have over alcohol if any of you are interested in hearing that story. Um, and that made me very suspicious that there, there were unable to have the consistency that you'd expect. I'm part of a number of Facebook groups for registered managers that continues to reinforce for me that it depends who you get. This is all about relationships, so you can get the person who wants to dot the I's and cross the T's, or the people who believe this is an opportunity to improve. So the inconsistency, even though there's some fantastic people at the top of CQC that I've met, and um, the belief that CQC is there to encourage improvement, um, wasn't really my experience until I met my inspector. Thank you. So thank, thank you, Helen. And, and one, one of the things that Helen and I have reflected on many times, because Helen and I were connected whilst I was in CQC, and, and helping her to kind of find people within the organisation to at least try and kind of smooth that process through the system, so kind of without prejudicing anything that would happen in the registration inspection process was, you know, out outwardly, Helen was having to kind of say to the world, you know, I've got this, don't worry, it's all under control, we'll be fine, but inwardly, you know, we, we could have had a graph of alcohol consumption, pardon my mentioning that, <laughs> or, <laughs> you know, caffeine consumption or lack of sleep or anything. It's, you know, psychologically and physiologically damaging uh, if this isn't done right. And, you know, fol following in the footsteps of all of your previous speakers, it's absolutely critical that we understand the role a regulator plays in the system. Um, they can make things better, they can make things worse. Okay. And I, and I think if you kind of go back to Toby's presentation, substitute the word commissioning for regulation, uh, you, you'd have a very, very similar story, I think. So, um, Peter Senge... Um, one of, one of the kind of well-known people in the systems world, talked about the problem of structure driving behaviour. 
And I think this is something actually that a lot of regulators have a big blind spot about. They, they don't realize the behavior that they create in the provider system. They're, they're blind to it and they will rationalize uh, dysfunctional behavior as kind of being the problem of the provider, not something that the imbalance of power in the regulatory system creates. So, uh, what, what, what I'm not doing is having a pop at regulators, because I think, um, you know, the planes have been falling out of the sky recently. We wouldn't want an unregulated airline system. You know, probably most of us would say we, we need some form of helpful regulation in the health and social care system. The question is, how do we work with regulators to help them do good work and to help us do good work? So, this is a, a, quick, a quick kind of show of hands. Um, <clears throat> th this is... Actually, one of the surprising things I found working with CQC, it's one of the very few organisations I've ever worked with who know what their purpose is. Most organisations don't. So that's, that's kind of one, one tick. They actually do know what their purpose is and they talk about it. Uh, we ensure health and social care provide safe, effective, compassionate... You can see I've worked for them, can't you? Safe, effective, compassionate, high-quality care and we encourage care services to improve. Okay, which, which, of, which of those two kind of bits of that... Statement of purpose, do you think, is predominant at the moment? <laughs> the first half or the second half? Yeah? They're, they're absolutely intent on, on helping to encourage improvement in the health and social care system. There's some great people in the organisation, uh, and, and you'll, you'll see when you, if you speak to Helen that she's managed to make some connections that are actually quite helpful and productive, but generally speaking, what people experience is this, rather than the right-hand side, yeah? And, you know, there, there is a whole industry, and this isn't just in health and social care, you see it in education as well, with Ofsted, of people who make money out of helping organisations prepare to pull the wool over the eyes of their regulators. Get yourself Ofsted ready. Get yourself CQC ready. Yeah, why would you spend money on doing that instead of learning how to be effective? It beggars belief, doesn't it? But of course, it's totally normal and understandable and none of these people are bad people. Okay, so what, what I want to talk about is how do we shift from what you might describe as a pathological relationship with regulation to a more purposeful and uh, generative relationship. So, so a, quick, a quick kind of framework that will helpfully uh, or hopefully be helpful for you. So, you know, cl clearly I can't give you an answer and can't claim to single-handedly have reformed the Care Quality Commission or the system of regulation in the UK. Um, but what I can do is hopefully give you some things that will help you be more powerful and more skillful and have more agency in your dealings with regulators, whichever field you're in, whether that's HMIP or, or whoever else, HMIC. Um, so th these, these are some descriptions of what a pathological relationship might look like. Uh, see if you recognise any of these things. An unequal power between the regulator and the regulated. Yeah, who, who, who worries about fridge temperatures when you know the inspectors are coming? You know, that's, that's kind of a running joke in CQC when everybody eye rolls and says, oh, you know, isn't it daft if the only thing that our frontline inspection staff do is check on people's fridge temperatures? Well, you know, guess what conversation I had with a registered manager last night over dinner about what they were, what they were caught up on on their inspection. Yeah. <laughs> not, not is this something innovative and creative that has the potential to transform the landscape of care in our system? You appear to have some decimal places out of position in your fridge temperatures. Defensive reasoning. Do we, do we see any defensive reasoning in, in our provider spaces? What do we need to do to make sure that everything's okay when the inspector turns up? You know, school teachers prepping classrooms full of children uh, and rehearsing the lesson that's going to be taught when Ofsted come. Yeah. Uh, formal interactions. Yeah. So, so very, very structured and formal interaction with the regulator. Um, we, we design for compliance and game to hit the numbers. Makes sense. A reactive response to regulation uh, and, and serious efforts to contain the inspectors rather than engage with them. Yeah. 
Okay, so that's a pathological relationship. And again, you know, these things aren't binary or completely linear. You know, you, you can recognise different, different forms of dysfunction. Um, what, what might better look like? Well, a purposeful relationship will look more like shared power, mutual trust and respect. You know, these things are possible. And, and actually, um, it, it's a bit like the Milgram experiment. Once you've understood how the Milgram experiment works, you're less likely to be compliant yourself. So, so if, you're, if you decide that you have more agency and you want to conduct yourself this way, you will actually be able to engage more productively with your regulator. And, you know, the problem is you, you're likely to have the experience that Helen had, which is you might get unlucky and have a bit of an old-fashioned tooth-sucking clipboard wielding inspector turn up you might get lucky and have somebody that's really open-minded and very interested in developing relationships and supporting improvement those people do exist there's some there's some really good people out there um, productive reasoning and appreciative inquiry space for informal interaction so what one of the members um, of my team um, that I've just left recently she, she used to be an inspection manager in the south uh, of England it was a hospital trust that was going through um, a, a serious program of, of, of reform and improvement uh, and instead of just doing normal inspections by the book she suspended the inspection program and scheduled her time to have lots of regular informal visits and connection so that she could understand how they were moving through that program yeah uh, it's perfectly possible and that was much much more helpful for her much much more helpful for the leadership in the hospital trust and established an entirely different type of productive relationship with that organization designing for value so do we actually understand the things that we do as a regulator that make a difference in organizations and i'll come on to that in a second so uh, <clears throat> here, are, here are some uh, eight regulatory mechanisms that I would kind of commend to you. Uh, all models are flawed. Some models are more useful than others. This is from some research that was done by University of Manchester uh, and King's Fund, which are basically the different methods that regulators can use to try and uh, encourage improvement and, and uh, effective performance in organisations. The reason I've put the first two... Uh, in dark is because they tend to be the predominant modes that you will experience. But if we want to create a better mode of regulation, and that's both how we, how we behave towards our regulators and how they uh, interact with us, we need to work on more of the other eight. So organisational art, think things that we change in our organisation because they are good things to do. So we might introduce kind of uh, improvement skills development programs into the organization to improve our organization's ability to learn and improve. Those are organizational changes that could be stimulated by regulatory support. Relational uh, in mechanisms are where uh, we change the nature of the relationship between the inspector and the, the provider organization. So that's an example of what happened with the hospital. Instead of formal inspection, we're actually just making a connection and I'm helping you understand how to drive learning and improvement. Informational, uh, publishing more and more information about good practice, helping people understand where there are networks of innovation and improvement, and that takes you into stakeholder as well. We've, we started to do quite a bit of work with NHS improvement to help hospital trusts find resources and support for improvement in their organisations. Uh, lateral is organisations collaborating with each other, and, and systemic is making changes to the wider system that will enable improvement to happen. So uh, one, one of the deputy chief inspectors that I got to know quite well, uh, Paul Lelia, lo lovely guy, he leads the mental health um, inspection uh, part of the CQC, has done loads of work to affect mental health. Um, health and social care, is a complex system. Uh, and one of, the, one of the big things I was saying to people in the CQC almost every day is you need to understand that the organisations you have a legal responsibility to regulate, hospitals, GPs, dentists, ambulance trusts, uh, social care organisations, um, that's not necessarily where the innovation is coming from. Uh, I've worked with people in the police force 
who are doing much more important and interesting innovation than people in the health and social care system. You need to go talk to them. Yeah, the complexity of the system uh, is very important to engage with. And inspection, inspecting and rating organisations just will not cut the mustard. So, um, just to summarise, a couple of top tips. Th these are things that I would like you to kind of worry about and think about to hopefully give you more agency. You've got to embrace your inspector. No matter how painful it is, you now, you now know that you have like-minded people and friends in the room, people that are going through this experience. Talk to them, get support, embrace your inspector, and, and recognise that there is a power imbalance. The regulators will always have more power, so don't kind of get in a strop about it, but think about how you're going to work with that. Be pragmatic about that. Stay principled. Use that idea of shifting from pathological to generative and those eight mechanisms to figure out ways of engaging more productively and asking them to engage. Find the people in your regulator who are willing to talk to you. They are there. <laughs> uh, and innovate for integration. For, for integrated systems, we have to move away from inspecting and rating organisations. It just does not cut the mustard. Those other mechanisms are much more important. So um, I listened to a podcast. I'm going to finish in five seconds. Yesterday, uh, it was Daniel Kahneman being uh, interviewed by uh, Sam Harris. And I don't know if anyone's listened to that podcast. Really, really interesting podcast. Uh, Kahneman was talking about um, peak and end experiences. That's what people take away. That's what they store in their memories. So the good news is uh, you've had a load of peaks already. So you remember those peaks. Wasn't, wasn't Mark wonderful? Didn't Adele you know, give us a great story? So you've had a number of brilliant peaks, Toby. Um, and so I have to come up with an end that's going to lodge itself in your memory. So Helen, Helen's going Helen's to be my end. Here she is again. The good news is, and this is just to prove that regulation uh, can, can shift gradually, gradually. Uh, Helen's relationship with CQC has been so successful that they're now going to make a short film and documentary with Helen and her inspector. So it's a bit like when Harry met Sally, it's when Helen <laughs> met Ben. Uh, they're actually going to be captured in a little film to talk about how they manage to work together to kind of wrestle with the nature of different regulation for well-being teams and innovative systems. So it is possible. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>